for coming back after the long sauna sessions yesterday. Um, so, as you remember, yesterday we started talking about bias and fairness in machine learning. And this, I mean, as the discussion then and at the poster session afterwards also showed, this can be a controversial topic because the, the notion of what is fair is a very personal one or a societal one, and there's not one notion of what you consider fair. So, uh, when it comes to doing the dishes at home, what I consider fair is very different from what I consider fair. Yes. No one's wrong. Okay, apparently green and yellow are different colors. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to repeat my jokes. I'm just going to say that fairness itself, um, my lecture is not about what is fair in life, right? My lecture is about the statistical notion of algorithmic fairness, which is techniques in machine learning to enforce properties that are called fairness because they correspond to some real world quantities. Um, so what to enforce and what not to enforce, again, is a personal or a societal question to answer. And I mean, it's, it's easy to get into discussion between like progressives and conservatives and whatever we want. Um, so I'd like to take some like, steam out of that and let's take a very, very simple example that nobody hopefully can object to. Imagine you are overwhelmed with the now amount of TV shows that exist today. And you want to have your own machine learning classifier that suggests new TV shows to you. So far, you've only watched Estonian language shows. But now you want to branch into English ones, right? So you want to maybe have a method that even though in the past the data was different, now you want to have at least half of the shows suggested in English and half of them suggested in Estonian. That would be a fairness criterion between these languages. So. On that level, hopefully, um, we can argue later what's fair, but we don't have to fight about it. Anyway, let's talk about group fairness, because as I said, individual fairness is too hard for me. Um, so, <clears throat> and this typically comes out of very good intentions. So um, we have a graduate school, we keep recruiting to it, and of course you notice certain patterns. Certain groups happen to st hire more people from a certain nationality than others. Typically, if the professor of that group is of the same nationality. Why is that? Do they get better uh, applicants from that country? Or maybe they have an implicit bias into that? Um, we can always check at which level the ratio of like um, female to male candidates changes. And ultimately, the recruiting process, including personal interviews, is extremely subjective. Right? Like somebody comes into the room, you have a positive or negative impression. Regardless if they are good scientists or not, you might already um, have a, I mean, made up your mind within the first few seconds, psychology shows. So there's a, I mean, in many areas, there's a very I mean, well-justified reason to say, like, maybe we should take this human factor out of the loop. We should have built some automatic system that decide based only on the facts um, and not based on human prejudice or so. I think this is something people can agree on. We would like to be more objective in that sense. <clears throat> Grad school admissions would be an easy case because it happens every year. So we take applications and the decisions whom to accept from last year and then we train a classifier on this that on, on new applications can tell us who should we invite for interviews or who should we, I mean, make an offer to and who not. Uh, and clearly this will be a very objective system, right? Except it won't because the data that we use to train the system will already be biased. So if in the past we ne never hired a single student from Estonia, then the classifier will learn, well, Estonian students you can immediately kick out, they would never be hired. Right? And then you will never hire them in the future, which reinforces the process and so on. So the, if, if any group in this group fairness notion has been treated unfairly in the past, rejected too often or too much, then the classifier will just learn to repeat these steps. Um, at the same time, we do not have any kind of objective so-called ground truth, because we don't know if these were good students that should have been accepted or not, or good TV shows to watch or not. Right? If we don't sample them, we cannot check if they were good. So, if we just check for accuracy of our classifier on any data we have, it will be perfectly fine because we don't have data that tells us what, what went wrong. Um, so in the rest of this segment, I will tell you um, how machine learning has started covering this, how to define things such that we can talk about them on a formal level rather than hand gravely, how to measure fairness and how to enforce fairness of this notion um, in decision systems. So for that, we need a little bit of notation again. As I said before, we're working with probabilistic quantities. No, nothing we, we work with is completely set in stone. We're going to have inputs that could be 
the description of the TV show um, on IMDb. Um, we have a target value that we want to predict. Should, how highly should I rank this show? Should I watch it or not? But then we also have this sensitive attribute, which is the one that we don't want to discriminate against, which could here be language. Um, and finally, we have um, classifier outputs. So this is the output of our system. Um, we call it f of x before. And usually our goal is to make f of x equal to y. But if there's fairness involved, there's other criteria. Um, in the example of grad school recruiting, inputs are documents. Um, outputs is whether this person uh, should get a job offer. And the Y is whether this actually would be a good candidate, the ground truth. And the A could be any kind of uh, defining properties, such as gender or race or language. Or so. <clears throat> so the first thing that comes to mind um, is if we want to ensure fair treatment, we should not ask for this sensitive attribute. right? If you, if you submit your CV, you shouldn't write, um, or I don't know what you should write. But when you hire, I mean, when you hire in a company, you might not be allowed to ask for the gender of the person or for the sexual orientation, right? So maybe you don't start your CV with the words, I am a gay student from so-and-so. Maybe you don't want to put that because it might be discriminating against you. Um, and this is, in fact, written in law that certain things are not allowed to be asked. Like when you ask for a job interview, you're not allowed to ask if the person is pregnant, for example. Um, however, this is not going to fool an automatic system. There's plenty of other data in your application that will be correlated with this. Um, names, you cannot get rid of all the names, right? Photos, if people upload photos. Certain steps in your CV are correlated with, uh, with gender in this case. Um, there's indirect effects. So women tend to supervise more female students. So if lots of your students are female, then probably the PI is female and so on. Um, and finally, for grad school admission, you get a letter from somebody who writes, she is the best student I ever had. That's a pretty good indicator of if, if you're a man or a woman. So hiding this information from the classifier is going to give you some kind of pretend notion of objectivity, but the classifier can be as biased as before. Because um, the information needed can be extracted from other features, not the one that you left out. So this notion of fairness through unawareness that, as I said, is also in the law, um, is, is, is an illusion. I mean, this, this is not what we want. Um. <clears throat> so instead, we need some kind of statistically well-grounded notions of what it means to not discriminate against the group. Um, and the, the recent developments have been that these were actually formalized as statistical properties between the different quantities involved, the inputs, the outputs, the decisions, and, and this protected attribute. And the two most, um, most popular ones, there's, there's a survey with list 18 different ones that all apply in different situations. But the two most popular ones probably are independence, also known as demographic parity, and separation, also known as equalized odds. So independence statistically means that the decisions you make are should be statistically independent from the uh, protected attribute. Um, Separation means the decision should be statistically independent if you condition on the true outcome. And we'll see what the difference between this is. Um, in both cases, all we can influence is our decisions, right? So the other things are given to us. So these are just, if we want to enforce these, depend, these conditions, then we, all we can do is influence what the predictor outputs. Right? We cannot influence the rest of the, uh, of the attributes. <clears throat> so let's start with independence. Um, uh, independence means that statistical independence between the outcome and the protected attribute in the most common case of binary classification would mean that, well, if you are the probability of outputting except given that your class A is the same as conditional probability that your output except given class B, meaning each group has the same acceptance probability. So English TV shows have the same acceptance probability as Estonian TV shows and so on. Um, so this is a simple criterion that is simple to sec check, right? So you just look at each group separately and say how many of them were accepted uh, by, my, by our classifier. <clears throat> um, and this is something that, that pops up a lot. And in some situations, we consider this fair. So maybe male and female applicants have the same probability of getting a job offer or a bank loan. Um, paper submissions from China have the same chance of being accepted as submissions from the US. Maybe this is a, a, a quantity we want. Um, but of course, there's also situations where we might say these statements are not correct, right? This just, it expresses a statement, but if we want the statement or not, again, it's a different decision. 
Um, and this pops up in different communities. Um, so in machine learning, it's called independence or demographic parity, else it's called statistical parity or no disparate impact. Um, in legal documents, you will find it um, they're not with exact values, but you have to not, these two values are not allowed to differ too much from each other, the rule of 80% or so. So this is, I mean, it, it pops up in different um, contexts. <clears throat> now, how can we enforce a classifier to have this property? So how can we train a classifier such that it will have equal acceptance probability for class A as for class B? Um, if we just train to minimize the loss, that might not be the case. Um, people came up with a bunch of techniques um, that ha actually more or less intervene at any stage of the possible process. So the, the one very classical method would be that you change your input data until it fulfills this condition, and then you hope that if you train a classifier on data that fulfills the condition, you also get it at prediction time. So you would downweigh certain parts of the data and upweigh others, or you would subsample groups and upsample others until the acceptance proportions of both classes are the same. Um, similar to the previous that I talked about last week on domain adaptation, you can also put this a little later, so when you extract features from your data, you can make sure that the features that you extract from class A and the features you extract from class B are not distinguishable anymore. So there's no information about the protected attribute in this anymore. And then if the, if the information is gone, then it can never come back, so any later step cannot depend on this uh, property A anymore. And that doesn't mean the individual feature entry, but that means statistically the, the dependence um, between, the, um, between the variable and the features. Um, one simple way if you do control the training process is to just change the training objective to reflect this. So instead of just training for the loss, you train to a loss plus a term that enforces fairness. We'll see that in a second. And finally, I mean, maybe the most popular and easiest to understand is post-processing. So just train your system as normal, but then the decisions you make in the end are adjusted such that um, you, you make uh, equal acceptance probability in this case. And we'll see the example of that as well. So the first, as I said, is, is training with independence constraints or regularizer. So this is the standard optimization problem uh, we saw before. You want to minimize this clearly L here, the um, total loss over your training set, and you evaluate your loss function between the ground truth and your model um, overall training data. This gives you highest accuracy if you optimize it. But then you can add a term that is a penalizer for um, parameter values that lead to unfairness. Where unfairness we have to compute based on one of the criteria, and here I just take the difference between the sum over all class, uh, samples that have property A. So I sum over all of them at average, so this is the average outcome of my classifier on class A, and this is the average outcome of my classifier on class B. My fairness condition is these should be the same, so I just compute the difference, square it, and that way my model will be penalized if it makes uh, non-equal predictions on average across the two classes. For the attribute um, okay, sure, yes. <laughs> it's very hard to. Um, so the question is, does this work for continuous attributes? Um, the whole thing is very ill-defined for continuous attributes. Um, so because you cannot compute the, the mutual information or the independence between continuous quantities, so obviously. Um, so all of this is typically defined in terms of discrete, sometimes even binary classes. So um, you can go from two classes to more than two. But you, I mean, going to continuous is a completely different field. So I don't have anything prepared for continuous variables. It's also less clear what we mean then, because we need nobody might have exactly the same um, continuous value as the other, so we need some kind of notion of similarity in that space. Um, that's, that's clearly beyond. I don't even know if there is any kind of convincing methods out of the box, so it might all be more, more specialized to the situation. These are very general purpose methods, right? It doesn't matter if you rank movies or if you rank candidates or if you do a bank loan, this formula will be the same. Um, it also shows that this is not rocket science, right? You just say, what do I want my classifier to have? It should make these two quantities the same. Well, I compute the difference, square it, put it in my training objective. Fairness solved, well, maybe. Um, the second example is um, post-processing. 
And, and this is probably the first method that came up and maybe also the most controversial because um, it, it can appear unfair in the end. And that is, um, you just train your decision system and it outputs some kind of confidence. In this case, uh, scores between minus five and plus two. So group A gets minus five to plus two and my group B is slightly smaller and it also gets minus five to well plus one or so here. So these are just the two scores for the group. And then the default would be to have a classifier by thresholding this at zero. So then if you say everything above zero will get a job offer or will, I will watch, um, you would accept 8% on the left and 3% on the right, which is not the same acceptance ratio, obviously. So independence is violated. This classifier is not fair in our notion of, indi of independence. So what can we do? Well, we can just change the acceptance threshold. We don't have to retrain the classifier for that. So in particular, we can just lower the threshold for one of the groups, let's say for the minority group here, such that you also have 8% acceptance rate. So then this is 8% and this is 8%. Um, unfortunately, now we accept more than we would have originally and you don't have that many hours in the week to watch TV shows. So this would not be acceptable. I mean, it would be fair, but it wouldn't fulfill the criterion that you had before that maybe you can't watch more than five, 50 TV shows a, a, a week or something. So this is not a good solution either. So what we have to do is we have to compensate in the other group. So ultimately, we'll have to lower the threshold on one side from zero to point minus three, and we have to raise it in the other to point one two, and then we have overall the same acceptance rate of 6.7% as before, and each of the groups also has 6.7% as before. So this now is a classifier that um, fulfills, um, fulfills independence. It's fair in our notion currently. Um, and it accepts as many cases as it did before, so probably all the other constraints you had were also fulfilled. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, this is quite controversial because if you are part of the blue group, now suddenly you have to raise, jump over a higher bar to be like accepted um, just because somebody else said the orange also want a space at the table. So um, this can be more controversial than the previous, where in the end both would be thresholded by zero just because the people take the scores for granted um, regardless of how you're very computed. The other problem about this approach is that in order to actually know which threshold to decide based on later at prediction time, you need to know the sensitive attribute, right? So you know that for everybody of class A, you have to use this threshold. For everybody of class B, you have to use that threshold, which again feels unfair. And also it means you have to ask for the sensitive attribute. So explicitly without asking for it, you cannot be fair. It's the opposite of what typically we would imagine. <coughs> um, so, Enforcing these criteria is actually doable, um, but they do have a bunch of problems. And the first problem is that this independence criterion can prevent you from getting a perfect classifier in the end. So if you want to build a perfect classifier, that would mean the output is exactly the correct answer Y. Um, well, this will be forbidden unless the correct answer is statistically independent from the protected attribute, which might or might not be the case. So. Um, you might be stuck with a suboptimal in terms of accuracy classifier because you enforce fairness. So sometimes there's a trade-off between accuracy and fairness, even without bias in the data. Um, the other is that this criterion alone does not guarantee any kind of equal treatment. So if you have candidates from class A, you can hire the best so and so many, whereas if you have class B, you can hire the worst or the, a, a, a random percentage that will give them the same acceptance ratio, but that doesn't mean they are treated fairly. And it's not even malicious necessarily that you hire random people from class B. Maybe you just don't know how to judge people. Maybe this is grad school, but they are come from a liberal arts college where you have no clue how to judge the grades. So your decisions are automatically worse if you know less about the field, even if you try your best. Or um, maybe you just don't have data, right? You've never watched an English TV show before. How would you judge it if it's a good one or not? Um, <clears throat> so this was cases where independence criteria is fulfilled but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a good way of enforcing it. Um, it's just one aspect that one has to consider. Um, it can even worse if you think about this not as a one-time process, but as a, as a repeated process with feedback loops. So if you give bank loans, for example, you might say, well, every race should have the same acceptance probability. So, um, I don't know, white applicants should have the same acceptance probability as Native American applicants, as black applicants, as Asian applicants, or whatever the definitions of race currently are there. Um, but if you then increase, I mean, if you then have a score and you increase it 
um, to make it easier for certain groups, but then some of them are not able to pay back their loans, then they will just, <laughs> the impression will just be, well, yeah, because, I mean, these people cannot pay back their loans, so we should treat them worse or something like that. And that's not necessarily because they can't, but because the decision whom to give the loan was worse. It's not the total amount, it's just that our classifier for this subgroup was bad. So there's a lot of things to consider um, beyond just making these ratios the same. Um, and then the third one that probably already was in your mind, that this is not necessarily what we call consider fair. Um, it might be too strong a criterion to enforce. Take the example of paper acceptance. So a fair decision rule would say, well, every continent should have the same acceptance rate. Um, uh, every continent, yeah. Um, but maybe papers from some continents are just on average better, right? Maybe an average science from Estonia is better than science from Germany, who knows? Right? So maybe it wouldn't be fair to just say, well, proportionate to how many applied, how many things were submitted, you want to accept a certain proportion. If you do enforce this, you can easily be gamed, right? So people just submit a bunch of random stuff, and then they have twice as many, so also twice as many will be accepted. The garbage will be thrown out, but of the others, twice as much gets in, right? So um, it's... It's not, in some situation it is the right measure of fairness, in some situation it's not. Right? As I said, it's context dependent. Um, it might also be too weak as a criterion. So um, statistics show that if candidates apply, I mean, for political office, um, men and women have a roughly equal um, chance of being elected. So when women try to be president, or when men try to be president, maybe except the US, the chances are pretty much the same. Nevertheless, only 2% of world presidents are women, even though 50% of people are, or 51. So that means there's some problem in, for representing both equally, um, if that is the goal. It's not enough to make the same acceptance proportions, but you would have to actually raise the amount of candidates in the first place. So it's too weak as a criterion for fairness in that respect. <clears throat> Let's move to the second criterion, separation. So this would mean that the acceptance proportions are the same per group, but not over the whole bunch of cases, but conditioned on the actual true outcome, so on the ground truth. Meaning, um, if, you, if you have two outcomes, yes and no, eligible or not eligible, good student, bad student, good TV show, bad TV show, um, then for each of these outcomes separately, the acceptance rate should be the same. So one of them is called the true positive rate, for all the true, actually positive cases, how many of them are accepted? And the other is the false positive rate. So how many of the actual not good cases are nevertheless accepted? Um, separation means you sh each group should have the same true positive rate and the same false positive rate. Um, and that would mean not every man and every male and every female candidate has the same chance of being accepted, but every qualified candidate has the same chance to be accepted. And in some situations, this reflects better what we think by by fairness. Um, interestingly, independence and separation are often mutually exclusive. So you cannot enforce both, um, except for special situations or trivial situation of the data. Um, and what, what is called separation here, it, it also has other names in literature, including equalized odds. Um, it can also be applied only to the true positive rate, not to the false positive rate. Then it's called equality of opportunity. Uh, so the top cases are treated fairly. The bottom cases, who cares? Um, so again, it shows up in different contexts. <clears throat> um, again, separation, it can be enforced in similar ways as the previous, and it has some positive properties and some shortcomings. Um, separation does allow you to make perfect decisions. If you predict exactly the ground truth, by luck or whatever, then you have a true positive rate of 100% and a false positive rate of 0% that holds for all the groups. So um, separation is... Um, is fulfilled and accuracy is 100%. So this is a, often a good property to have. Um, in some situations, this also means that we might be more fair than the independence criterion. Again, whatever we mean by that in that situation. Paper acceptance should not just depend on the author's origin, but maybe it depends on the quality of the paper as well. So out of all the good papers, the acceptance chances shouldn't depend on which continent they were written on. Um, and the bad papers, the decision shouldn't depend. But that doesn't mean that across all papers you have the, same, have the same acceptance ratio. So the quality determines the chances, not the author origin. Um, 
disadvantages is in particular practical ones. So enforcing or I mean measuring in a separation, should it say here, um, can be hard uh, in practice, and also it's prone to data set bias. Because what, if you want to measure if you fulfill this or not, you need to know the ground truth outcome. But if my data set is biased and the ground truth is biased, then it's not actually usable to estimate if we fulfill this separation or not. Um, and finally, it's also not always what we think of as fair, right? It's not that one criteria of fairness, I mean, fulfills all situations. So if you have, um, or this is a constructed example, but if you have 10 astronauts flying to Mars, um, then probably the ratio of men who will fulfill the minimum requirement of like a technical studies and having a certain height and a certain blood pressure and so on, um, experience as a test pilot, um, more men than women will fulfill this. So maybe in the pool of all qualified candidates in the end, there's more win men than women. Does that mean we should send nine men and one woman to Mars? Or maybe should we say, well, we want equal representation, we send five and five, because there is enough good candidates, right? Um, there is enough from all groups. Which one we send doesn't necessarily have to be proportionally to how many there are. <coughs> um, how would we achieve this separation criteria? Um, so this is one of these um, ROC curves uh, that, that lists the false positive rate on the horizontal axis and the true positive rate on the vertical axis if you change your threshold from very negative. So if you, um, if you think of the previous histograms, we could move our threshold what to accept and what not to accept. Right? And if we accept, if our threshold is very far on the left, wait, that's, that's there for you, then you would accept everything, which would mean you make all the, uh, yes, you would accept everything, which means all the true positives are accepted and all the false positives uh, all the negative, true negatives are also accepted, meaning the true positive rate is 100% and the false positive rate is 0%. And this corresponds to this point down here. So it's the, um, ah, because I drew it false. So this should be 1 minus false positive at 100, and this should be true positive. No, sorry, the other one. This should be 1 minus true positive. So you have no false positives. Damn it. No, sorry, you're up here. You accept all the positives, meaning for true positive is one, and you accept all negatives, which means false positive is also one. If you raise your threshold, then fewer and fewer cases are accepted until eventually you end up down here where nothing is accepted, so the acceptance rate for both classes is zero. If you would choose randomly, you would be on this diagonal, but if you have a good classifier, it will be a curve somewhere up here. Let's assume this is the curve we have, and these are the different points where we can operate with our threshold. So this would be the scores overall, but as I said, we want to do this different per class in order to achieve fairness, so the, there are two curves here, one for class A and one for class B. Now, the criterion of separation means that they should have the same false positive and the same true positive value, right? Which means the two curves must intersect. So the only point where this is the case, apart from trivial zero and one, is somewhere in the middle. So the only classifier that you could achieve by changing your scoring thresholds would actually be this one, um, which probably is not acceptable. It has 50% false positives. On, well, I mean, this might not be the working point where you want to be. Um, it might also be that they never overlap, right? It could be that one curve is always above the other, and then apart from trivial solution, there is no post-processing method that would achieve this fairness notion. So the, the, taking the scores and adjusting them to achieve separation is not always possible. So if you, yes, I can repeat it. Uh, but you could also sacrifice uh, your performance. So you could, uh, I don't know, in principle, um, do a random, do a mix with a random classifier. So you could kind of artificially pull the other. Would you like to press down. the next button for ah. me? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, what you can do is you can add additional randomization. So you can just, um, sacrifice accuracy for fairness by saying, well, I would be 80% correct for this class, but the other class is just 60% correct, so I artificially reduce myself, which means I can reach any point in this, um, in this pink shaded region. Um, I can't go above because that would mean I make my classifier better than it was by randomization, but I can make it worse. Um, sometimes this might be what you want, right? If it's, if it's something super sensitive and you say like, unfortunately for historical reason, my classifier is only 50% correct for this group, if I make it 90% correct for that group, that would be unfair. Maybe I have to add randomization. It's probably not for paper acceptance, but it, I mean, 
again, it's a societal process, what you want. Maybe for TV shows, it's not a big deal if you do that and you have a bit more randomness in one of the shows. <coughs> um, the other step is that you actually relax your criteria and you go to this equality of opportunity measure, which only looks at the true positive rate. So only qualified candidates have the same probability of being accepted. Two qualified candidates for grad school have the same acceptance probability. The ones who are not qualified but they're still accepted, well, these are un, I mean, undesirable outlier cases anyway. So um, if one of them is accepted, has a slightly higher chance to be randomly accepted than the other, maybe we can deal with that. Again, it's a context specific if this is what we want. It is definitely easy to achieve because then we don't have the curves to intersect, but they just have to lay on the same horizontal line. And of course, the curves always lie on some, I mean, on every horizontal line, the curves lie somewhere. So the, this equality of opportunity is often much easier to achieve, um, for example, by score proper spot processing. Of course, you can achieve this by other criteria such as the one I had before, right? Pre-filtering your data or adding a regularizer. This will encourage it at training time. Um, and then this problem of intersecting curves is not necessarily a different case. <clears throat> okay, so this is my summary of fairness. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively recent field that intersects machine learning statistics, but also social science, psychology. Um, on the one hand, what is fair in which situation? That's not something machine learning people can answer, or at least not more than any other, right? We have personal opinions, but no scientific opinions. Um, and from the stats and ML field, um, how to formally express this such that a computer can understand this? Computers are not good at understanding hand-wavy notions, but they are good at expressing like ratio x is, better, is bigger than ratio y. Um, and how can we enforce these to actually occur when we train a classifier? Or this happens in retrieval, in any other kind of automatic decision system. Um, how to include these. Um, to keep in mind fairness through unawareness, just not asking for a certain sensitive property is A, not going to work with machine learning. Machine learning is too smart, it circumvents around it. Um, and it's also sometimes harmful um, if you have a system that tries to be fair, but it doesn't have the information of what it should, uh, information it should use for that, uh, like the threshold approach. Um, different notions, independent separation, different applications, equality of opportunity, again, uh, so this is what we happily can discuss at the, at the coffee break, which one applies to which problem in your life. Um, and finally, it's, it's a recent topic, but it's one that's taking off a lot with our machine learning systems being deployed all over the, the world for real world problems, right? It's not just Facebook, it's, I mean, it's not just what stories are presented on Facebook, but it's real world decisions, including this, the legal system in the US, but also in Europe by now. Um, so people have to deal with aspects beyond accuracy more. And this also the community of machine learning has noticed that um, what used to be something people laugh at is now suddenly a mainstream topic within a few years. That concludes the fairness part. Is there any questions? You must still be awake and dynamic, right? So. Yes, please. There's a microphone somewhere. So what about combinatorial explosions? So if you have race um, and gender and, let's say, disability, you have eight possibilities, how do you deal with this stuff? Um, I mean, is this a question of what you want to... I mean, ultimately, every person is individual, right? So if you just take all the properties combined, there will be no group fairness anymore. Um, people consider this in the case of one or two properties because these are typically the most blatantly violated ones, right? So shoe size probably doesn't matter so much. So people are very sensitive about gender, about race, maybe sexual orientation, but then it also depends on the context which one is the biggest problem. You can combine them. You would not do all combinations, right? You would not have a separate category for white, straight, male shoemaker. Um, but you would have a criterion for race, and you would also have a criterion for gender, and you would also have a criterion for job description, um, and then this linear in the number of attributes, not in the not exponential. But of course, there might be cases where this is not enough. But um, statistically, we don't really look at those. Uh, I have a question. Uh, in criminology. Uh, People who killed, uh, for example, uh, risk assessment models for, uh, for example, to give a parole to somebody, will always emphasize that the data 
actually doesn't uh, reflect actual crime. It, it just reflects what uh, is detected. So, uh, and so the data itself is already unfair and is already distorted. And so in some sense, uh, after the fact, uh, uh, the in uh, not you, you can't like uh, even uh, um, impose fairness because the data itself is unfair already. So do you also somehow try to measure uh, like, uh, I don't know, it's basically like an inverse problem. How, how, how do you measure the unfairness of the data itself? Because it also reflects, for example, in case of crim uh, uh, criminology, also policing and other such things as well. I mean, the, the problem of data that is not sampled independently from the true distribution, but that comes out of interventions. And I mean, if you arrest or even if you, I mean, check somebody on the street is an intervention, right? It's not that you randomly pick people and say, I want to check you. And there's, it's known that people pick certain targeted groups more than others, and there might be reasons for that or not, and so on. Um, I don't think you can tell just from the data itself whether it's biased or not. It's possible that a certain group is bigger than another group or that a group just commits more crime than another group. All of these are statistically possible. Um, you have to either impose external knowledge saying like, we know that this group is that proportion and that group is that proportion. So if they were checked on the street much more often, that means there is an imbalance that we have to fix. Um, or you have to just, well, either you know that there's a bias or you have to impose it, right? So you have to say, um, we, we estimate how often somebody was, or how the data is biased compared to other less biased data sources, like census data is less biased than police records. Um, and then you can estimate something like pros propensity. Pro <laughs> propensity. Um, what's the probability of seeing a certain thing in your data set even? So it's not the same as being the fraction of what is there, but the probability of I mean, seeing it if it is there. People in retrieval have to do that as well. So there is ways of kind of rebalancing your data according to external information. But the problem itself is, of course, super hard. If you don't have any additional information, you can... I mean, so the, um, the good thing about the original, the independence criterion, is that you don't need a lot of ground truth data for it. You just say any, I don't know, um, the fraction of people with this property and the fraction of people with that property should be equalized. It doesn't matter how, I mean, it's just, if 50% are arrested, so and so many of them go to jail, regardless of who they are. And of course, you still have the problem of later who is arrested, right? But that's not part of the classifier, that's part of the data generating process, which you have to address with other measures. Deep breath. We have two more minutes. And then we move to part two. Good. If there's no more questions, um, let's move to part two. So part two, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the more current research. All the previous was, of course, tutorial style stuff that has been around for many, 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 many months, which in machine learning terms is very long. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about topics that, uh, that are relating to um, the research in our group itself. So this is the topics that um, our research group has been looking at recently. Uh, it looks very diverse because it is. Everybody wants to work on other stuff. Um, but I'm going to concentrate on this, this aspect of trustworthy and robust and fair learning. Um, and I'm going to tell you basically the two things I announced. Um, so in the list of, of topics, we've made it beyond fair machine learning. So now we're going to talk about certified robustness against um, um, bad data at prediction time, at precise examples, and afterwards um, I'm going to tell you about robust and fair learning at training time um, in the multi-source setting. <coughs> okay, let's start with, with certified robustness. So, um, of course, everybody remembers the pandas, so we all remember that ne neural networks are strange because they have this tendency to have adversarial examples possible, meaning you can take a perfectly fine image like the panda on the left, but you can do a tiny bit of changes to the, uh, to the pixels in this case, just any small changes to your input data, regardless of what it is, it works with text as well, um, and you get a completely different classification and even with very high confidence. So artificially constructed noise can change the model output a lot. Um, 
And people try to fix this in a, in a number of ways. Here's a few more than we had just last time. So I mentioned that just adding more of these uh, adversarial examples to the training set is not going to solve the problem. And solving the robustified error mathematically is great, but practically it doesn't, it's, it's not enough. Um, people have also suggested other ways of like limit the symptoms. So for example, if you get an image, instead of classifying it, you smooth it to get rid of this noise, and then you classify it. Um, turns out that gets rid of the standard kind of attacks we had, but either you lose accuracy on the way because you smoothen a lot, or you are prone to a different kind of adversarial examples, which are then like more invariant to Gaussian smoothing. So it would not be like pixel here, pixel there, but it would be bigger structures that the Gaussian smoothing doesn't do. Yeah. So adversarial examples are not so stupid to fall for this. Um, one thing you can do is, in, so because these adversarial examples are a very small subset, um, you can randomly change your input data. That way the, you can't, the, the algorithm couldn't adapt to it easily. And if you do that a lot of times and take a majority vote, then you can guarantee that the certain radius around your original example will with high probability not be affected. Problem is, if you'd want guarantees, you need to do this like 100,000 times, so your system gets 100,000 times slower, which is typically not acceptable on your smartphone. So, um, so in a sense, all of these fix the symptom that the adversarial examples are there, but you just make them invisible. So the approach we wanted to have is that we want to have something which guarantees um, that no adversarial examples can exist because the model architecture just doesn't allow them. And the easiest you can do for that is um, you make the model, I mean, very smooth such that small changes in the input cannot have big outputs uh, changes. So we're going to work in a, in a standard multi-class setting. Imagine we have inputs and outputs. The output is just a bunch of categories such as, um, well, Panda or Gibbon or other labels for images. Same holds for other inputs. doesn't have to be images. And we're going to use a model that outputs confidences. So for each class, it outputs a number. And the number, high numbers mean it's more confident that this class is the true one. So then we can make predictions by just picking the biggest of all the confidences. <coughs> the first concept that you might remember from calculus is a Lipschitz constant. So the Lipschitz constant of a function g here is if you take two points that are um, x and x prime that have a certain distance from each other, x minus x prime distance, then the function value g of x minus g of x prime, which also have a certain distance, this distance cannot be bigger than a multiple of the original distance. So if the capital L is 1, then your, net, your function cannot make a, a change. A, no matter where you are, if two points are this far apart, the function values cannot be more than this apart. Um, so this is calculus 101, hopefully. Um, if the function is differentiable, then this relates to, this, to the slope, so to the gradient, or in the multidimensional case, to the Jacobian matrix. So if your function has like limited slope and no exponential, I mean, no infinitely steep pieces, it's automatically Lipschitz continuous, and the slope is like, I mean, the Lipschitz constant is bounded by the slope of the function. The second notion we need is that of a margin in classification. So the margin is defined as the, the value, the confidence value that the model outputs for the true label, g of x index y, y is the ground truth answer. So g of x is a vector, and y is the yth component of it. So for the original, it would be like, of the vector of all confidences, what's the panda entry? And then you subtract the value of the second biggest, so the maximum of everything that is not the ground truth label. Um, so it's the best, it's the, the, the confidence for the true value minus the confidence for everything that is not the ground truth. So if you predict, if the ground truth has the correct answer, that means your model makes the right prediction, then this will be a non-negative quantity, and otherwise we just set it to zero. So if the model makes a mistake, then this would be negative, and we just set it to zero. Um, so on the right, we have four classes, and the second one is the ground truth. It has the highest confidence. Class four has the second highest, and the margin is the difference between the highest and the second highest. So these two are important quantities because if you put them together, you get a notion of certified robust accuracy. And that is, um, you have a model that predicts with a certain margin between the classes, and it has a certain Lipschitz. Um, oh, no, sorry. So we want to achieve certified robustness first. A certified robustness means um, what we've seen before. Um, if you have a model that predicts the ground truth, 
it should do so not just in the point itself, but also in a, in a ball around it. So for all delta that are not too large, delta is less than epsilon in size, if we change our x by delta, we still want to get the ground truth answer. So it's not just in that point, but also around it in a certain radius correct. Um, if that holds, we say it's certifiably correct. Right? Um, so this is a mathematical definition, right? It's not that we could check this necessarily by hand, numerically, but it's the definition of what we want to achieve. Um, so this is for point x, y, and if you have that, if you have the whole data set, you can say like, what fraction of points fulfill this, and then you have what's called the certified robust accuracy on a certain data set. So for 89%, we are safe, not just in the point itself, but also in the radius epsilon around it, something like that. Okay, now all of this comes together in the following result. So if you have a model that is Lipschitz continuous, so small changes cannot ch change the output by a lot. Um, and then it will be epsilon, then an example will be epsilon certified robustly, so the decision will be correct, not just in the point, but also in the neighborhood. If the margin by which it classifies it is bigger then this constant, so L is how much the little change of the input can expand. Um, epsilon is how much the input changed. And square root of two is because Euclidean norms are weird. Um, so what happens is you, you have your original blue curve that we had before, and now you, you want to check in a certain radius epsilon around my point what's going to happen. We know that any change by at most epsilon cannot get bigger than L times epsilon in the output, which means our, our scores can go down by at most L times epsilon squared root of two here. And if the margin was so big that L times epsilon square root of two doesn't um, change, I mean, that, that the highest and the second highest cannot cross each other without moving more than this amount, that means the label cannot have changed, and we are robust. So by quantifying how much the network expands any kind of perturbation, and by how big the gap between classes was in the first place, we can ensure that this crossing, so the error cannot occur in a certain radius. And networks that are trained this way, such that they have a Lipschitz constant, typically the Lipschitz, I mean, so the Lipschitz constant typically is not arbitrary, but we set it to a constant because this is scale invariant, right? If you have 10 times bigger Lipschitz constant, you need a 10 times bigger margin, but since the network, you can just multiply everything by a constant and you get a multiple of the outputs. Um, typically, we, we enforce a fixed Lipschitz constant for simplicity. And then this is called the Lipschitz network. So how do we make a network with a fixed Lipschitz constant? For example, L equals one. Um, so again, we know for, I mean, for neural networks, we know that their structure in terms of computation is quite easy. For a decision tree, I would have no clue. But in neural networks, it's a very, I mean, it's a very simple modular um, object, right? It starts with the input, it makes some linear transformation and nonlinear transformation, linear transformation, nonlinear transformation, and so on, until it outputs something. And from calculus, again, we know that if we have a sequence of functions operating one after the other, then the Lipschitz constant of the whole thing is not bigger than the product of the individuals. If something expands by two and the next expands by two, the total expands at most by four. Um, and we also know that the Lipschitz constant is bounded by the Jacobian matrix of, the, of linear functions. Um, and if we have a nonlinearity by the derivative of the um, nonlinearity. So for a typical nonlinearity such as the ReLU, which is just zero and then identity, the derivative is never bigger than one. So that would be constant one. And while the Jacobian of a linear transformation here, the sort of the Jacobian matrix of W times X is just W transpose itself, or W if you want. So we have to control just the operator norm, the two norm of the weight matrix. If the weight matrix has a bounded norm, this immediately translates into a Lipschitz constant on the network. So we've reduced the problem of like making our network Lipschitz into how do we ensure that each norm, each weight matrix has a bounded norm of a certain given number. Um, so, uh, and now we're back in the realm of um, minimizing losses and, and, and training neural networks, right? So all we have now is an additional constraint to our learning process. <coughs> Um, and the method I'm going to tell you about is a project of my student Bernd, just uh, accepted at ECCB two, two weeks ago or so. Um, it's called Almost Orthogonal Layers. 
for general, uh, efficient general purpose Lipschitz networks, um, where the emphasis is on the general purpose and the efficient. So you can always achieve that something has a small operator norm by doing a singular value decomposition, setting some eigenvalues to one, and then putting the matrix back together. That's a totally valid way of making sure that something doesn't exceed a certain norm, but it's computationally very intensive, and if you have to do that for every matrix of your network, every step of the operation on every example, you will quickly run into problems with computation. Um, you, have, you can approximate this by some kind of power method, or you can expand it certain polynomials, and people have, I mean, from linear algebra, have found all kinds of ways to, to do this, but they are all um, kind of putting big hammers from um, typically linear algebra or uh, functional analysis, um, a big hammer which will solve the problem by a hot enforcing it. Um, so we wanted to have something which is easier. You want something which is like Lipschitz layer and you download it from PyTorch, you say just give me Lipschitz layer and then run it. And you don't need to like change the loss function, you don't need anything. You just say, here's a new layer that automatically has this property. <clears throat> and what he came up with is a very I mean, cute observation, which is that you can always achieve this by just normalizing your weights in some way. So what you actually do is you have your network which has this matrix multiplication followed by nonlinearity in each layer, and usually you just parameterize your weight matrix as an arbitrary matrix and you try and, right? So we reparameterize by saying our weight matrix is a product of two matrices, one which is free to choose any way, the P matrix now, it's an arbitrary parameter matrix, and another diagonal matrix which rescales the rows. Um, and the rescaling, so that's a diagonal matrix that just multiplies each row with a constant, and the constant is multi computed from the uh, elements of the P matrix itself. And this ensures that uh, if, you, if you then compute the operator norm of this W matrix, it's automatically fulfilled that it will have operator norm no more than one. And you can think of this just as like, if it was an operator, but it would be like just the norm of each row, it's obvious that if you take a matrix, no matter what it is, you divide each row by a constant, you can always, I mean, by the sum of entries, for example, then all afterwards the result will be a matrix with bounded row sum or so on. Right? So um, this is just the analog for, for this operator norm. <coughs> so with this kind of parameterization, the W matrices will automatically have norm one. That means each of the layers is automatically one Lipschitz, which means the whole network is automatically one Lipschitz. Um, and the observation is that if the matrix we started with, this P matrix, is orthogonal, meaning um, it's just expressing a rotation or so in space, then this D matrix, which is P transpose P, will be the identity, so nothing has changed. The normalization doesn't reduce the scale, uh, it just leaves the matrix as it is. If it wasn't orthogonal, it might rescale stuff. If it is orthogonal, uh, it's a tight inequality, and we don't lose any kind of dynamic range. <coughs> so. That's only part of the story, right? The other half is how do we make, I mean, we can always make the Lipschitz constant small by making all the weights tiny, but how do we enforce at the same time that you have a large margin between classes? Well, you need a loss function that does that. Um, and the one that we use, there's different suggestions, the one that we use is a very simple one. It's just, instead of computing the, in this case, cross entropy between the uh, prediction of the confidences and the ground truth, you take your predictions and you subtract a certain amount from the ground truth entry, making it look worse than it actually is, and then you compute the cross entropy. So this is, you take your original scores, but instead of taking a softmax of them to make them probability, you first subtract a multiple of the ground truth one hot vector. So this just subtracts the value u from the component of the ground truth. Then it takes softmax and compares it to the label, meaning um, in order to get a low score your model doesn't have to just make the correct entry big, but it has to make it bigger by a factor of u than the others. So this enforces a margin of the ground truth to the others if you can make it small. <clears throat> so if you put these two together, you can just train your neural network as before, run gradient descent uh, and so on, and you will learn a weight matrix, obviously, and when you then look at the, the learned parameter matrices, you will see that these are close to orthogonal not because we enforced them to, but because the learning process just made them this way, which is why we call it almost orthogonal matrices. And the explanation we have for this is that um, in order to fit the data, you need to have a certain dynamic range, right? Your images 
or any examples in your training set have a certain distance from each other, the labels have certain values, right? One is one zero zero, the other is zero zero one. The difference is square root of two. Um, so um, you need to have a certain dynamic range in your outputs, otherwise you cannot fit one zero zero and zero zero one on your data, data set. Um, so by itself, the network would always have the I mean, incentive to just get its variable bigger because that way you can fit more. So intrinsically, minimizing the loss means you want to fit more, you want to make your values as big as possible so that you can have very confident predictions. Um, but in, the, in this normalized setting, um, the range is always limited, and the way to make it the biggest possible is by making this normalization do nothing. Otherwise, the normalization will throw away dynamic range. And th it does nothing if the matrix is orthogonal. So just by the network trying to fit as much as possible the data, the uh, matrices will just try to make as much use as possible of this range where we allow them to be, which happens to be orthogonal matrices in the end. It's not perfect, right? So you can see that in this, I mean, on the diagonal, there's a few non-one uh, entries. Um, but, and of course, it doesn't have to be. It could be that certain, I mean, if you have two collinear regions, they could not be orthogonal to each other and so on. But just empirically, it's pretty close. Um, and since we don't enforce this, it just means that somehow this captured some kind of essence of that, like, um, preserving information in a network is possible as long as possible, because the, apart from the non-linearities afterwards, orthogonal matrices are invertible, right? So you can go forward with a rotation, and except for the ReLU, you can go backwards again. So information is preserved for a long time until it's thrown away in the classification layer. <coughs> so, um, of course, every good paper needs to have a big table of numbers that you can't read. Um, so just to give you a very short impression of how this stuff is evaluated, so and then once you created this network, you have to show that it's better than everything else out there, right? That's how we write papers. Uh, you have to beat every other method in the universe. Um, so first we observed in this first row, um, what we see here is we compare the new methods, which is AOL for different architectures, with previous methods that were robust and a standard convolutional network that isn't robust. And we check the accuracy without any kind of um, problems, just on the test set, and we measure the certified robustness, which we measure by, um, we don't compute this, this is inferred from the margins and the Lipschitz constant, which we both know. Um, so it might be that it's more robust, but this is the guaranteed robustness. And you see that the standard CNN just has none of them. You get, I mean, almost, I mean, even for the relatively small values of epsilon, um, you always find adversarial examples nearby. And then different methods were proposed, 2019, so in the distant past, 2021, 2021, 2022, and you see that they all have comparable standard accuracy, which is a bit lower than the standard accuracy of a standard network, and they have different amounts of robustness against more and more stronger and stronger perturbations. So people started with this very small value of 36 over 255, which is a strange value, but that's what the first person used, and then this has been used since. Um, and you see that it goes from 58 to 63, and our method also achieves roughly this amount of robustness. So 60% um, of the data on the CFR data set are now robustly classified with this margin. It's not by far not, a much, not enough to be happy or to put this on a self-driving car, but it's much more than 0%, right? So. And then you have bigger thresholds, and it, it, it deteriorates relatively quickly, so if you make the epsilon bigger, then you're down to 35%, and our method um, is actually much more robust in this kind of high change regime. So you get 40, almost 50% there, where the others had 30%, and then the others apparently didn't dare to go to higher epsilons, but I mean, we also report for higher, and we think ultimately we need to be robust to big changes of the data, not just small ones. <clears throat> okay, so, yes. Mm, do you think that uh, it's um, maybe the limitations of the architecture itself are already hitting here and, and it's almost like not possible even to get better robustness. Uh, for example, you're, you're doing here's convolutional feed forward, right? Yes. Um, so... Um, I don't think so. So if you would just, I mean the data point, so what limits this, this is measured on the data set, right? So you could imagine is there any assignment of weights in the network that would make the test samples 
nicely separated from each other with a margin, but the network still has a Lipschitz constant one. Right? And that shouldn't be a problem. All the test examples are far away from each other, much bigger than this epsilon equals one. So it should not be a problem. If you would just interpolate them with a line and learn only along that line, it should be easy. Um, I can't write down the equation. But the, the distance between samples is much bigger than this radius. So I don't think that it's a problem. It's more a problem that because you have this additional normalizing factors, it's harder to train. So the optimization takes longer. Um, of course, the, the capacity is lower than if you don't put any constraints. But then you just make it a bit wider and a bit deeper. I mean, this, these things are, I mean, more or less, I mean, this is still a universal approximator if you want, um, if you make it big enough. <laughs> so I think it's more a question of numerics. So I mean, a lot of problems in deep learning are uh, from the fact that even though the function class is great, um, the optimization doesn't necessarily do the perfect job of finding an answer even though it's a much better one than we think. And we don't want to break the fact that it learns good solutions, but we want it to, I mean, have certain additional properties that are much harder to enforce than for other systems. Also, what, I mean, if you, if you do this on CIFAR, life is good because CIFAR is tiny. Um, we not, then moved on to things like ImageNet, which is much bigger images and much more diversity. And then it turns out that the, um, you need a few more tricks to get it to train. Um, and you need, but at the same time, you can afford to lose something. So the dynamic range of the inputs is huge, right? Like one image is distance 5,000 from the next. So you don't need Lipschitz constant necessarily to be exactly one the Lipschitz constant could down in every layer a little bit. Um, so we have a bit more wiggle room to say like, okay, my weight don't have to be exactly orthogonal. I can have like columns coinciding and so on because there will still be enough dynamic range in the output to fit ones and zeros. Yes. Uh, would it work for vision transformers? <laughs> vision transformers are super annoying. Um, so, no, I mean, they're awesome, but in terms of analyzing them because of these pairwise interactions, um, so there is actually work that says vision transformers are not Lipschitz. You can show that, and it's a simple thing. You basically, if you have unbounded input data, then you can, I mean, vision transformers have this similarity, which is then normalized by a softmax or so, and you can show that if both things you multiply with each other, then an absolute difference of epsilon can basically change everything after you normalize it. So this softmax operation is just not Lipschitz if you allow arbitrarily big or small things. So very small times very big, Small changes here will have big outputs there if it's additive changes. Um, in a sense, it's an observation that might not be super relevant. <laughs> but you can also easily fix it by changing the softmax, I mean, either constraining your inputs to a certain non-exponentially large range, um, or by, I mean, putting up a different form of attention. So instead of in, in a product, you can do some kind of Gaussian blob, like, uh, uh, what were they called, radial basis function networks or so, um, which people have suggested. Um, since it's like two people looking at that, whereas 50,000 people are looking at transformers, it's much further, I mean, it's not as far developed. Um, and maybe it's not the best architecture because you do have these pairwise interactions, and that would mean probably you get some quadratic effects in the epsilon, whatever that means then for the output, who knows. Um, we looked at the, the MLP mixer, in case you're aware of that, so that is a, a new architecture that came after transformers from Google where they observed that attention is not needed anyway. Um, they didn't call the paper that, but almost. Um, which is more or less that fully connected networks are making a comeback. Because once you have so much data that you can fit billions of parameters, then the idea of convolutions and of this explicit structure of patches and so on isn't so important anymore. And you can just fit fully, con fully connect networks of huge size if you just have enough data. And MLP Mixer is a smart thing which like uses fully connected and then it does some operation where pixel space turns into channel space, then it fully connected again, then it turns channel space back to pixel space in case you know what that means. It's a, it's a cute architecture that is very simple. You can write it down in like eight lines of code. Um, and if you have enough data, um, it works surprisingly well, comparable or better than transformers. Um, but you do need a lot of data. You have to be Google to, to train it essentially. Um, the good thing is it's very nice, it's straightforward, it's feed forward, there's no cycles, there's no self-attention. So this you can actually make Lipschitz continuous then. Um, 
Okay, so let me come to the last part of the scientific lecture then, um, which is learning from multiple sources. Um, and this is a, a project direction that has been going on for a while in our group. Um, and it's based on the observation that um, modern machine learning systems are trained on a lot of data. Well, that is not news to you, but the data, I mean, how do you get this data? And the, the observation is that the, nobody can sit down and create a data set with five billion examples of natural language text or of anything else themselves, right? These are always collaborative efforts where data from multiple sources is downloaded or created and then combined. So there's pretty much no big data set out there that is one monolithic thing that one person created. I mean, I don't know, maybe you remember, um, there's a, a computer vision researcher called Antonio Torralba uh, at MIT, and he created a data set, label me data set, where all annotation was done by his grandmother. She just liked to sit down and draw bounding boxes or rectangles or polygons into it. So, um, she got an award at the conference for that. Um, so, but this might be the last existing data set which was created by one person. Um, everything else is collected, and either you download from a huge chunk of data from the web, and then you have hundreds of people on crowdsourcing platforms to create the annotation for it, or you just do any other me mechanism for collecting it. So, um, you can have di different sources of text data on the web, Nobody trains just on Wikipedia, that would also have a bias, right? You also take Twitter, and if you're unlucky, you take Reddit, and so on. Um, or if you do biological research, no hospital itself has enough data, but if you can, in a private way, combine data from many hospitals or, or labs, all the COVID tests in the world is combined, then you suddenly have a huge data set to work with. Um, user phones are a big source of data, of course, privacy again, but otherwise, you will have billions of devices um, which all give you a little bit data, but if you put a little bit times a billion, you have a lot of data, and so on. So the, the observation is, even though machine learning typically says you're given a data set, in the real world, you have more. You have many data sets, and then you can throw them together. And in fact, if all the data have the same distribution, which is clean and IID sampled, and so on, then this is the right thing to do. You should just throw your data all together. You have a new data set, which is still sorry, independently sampled in IID. Um, and you have a big data of, you need a lot of computers, but there's no other problems popping up with this. Um, but what if some of the data sources are not of that type? So what if some of the data sources are unreliable, they are noisy, or they're just some malicious user who wants to make your chatbot into a racist, uh, whatever. So what if some of the data you work with is unreliable? Uh, you can also think of this as a federated setting, if you know what it is, but I'm not going to talk about it in this. In the privacy aspect, I will not consider. I will just consider the problem of my data is not as it should be, as I started yesterday's lecture. So if a, a fraction of the data sources is biased, noisy, manipulated, and then we throw it all together, that means we have a data set in which a certain fraction is manipulated. And we already seen the last time that then there's a classic result that there exists no algorithm that can ensure to overcome this manipulation. So we will always be limited in the accuracy that our system can have, at least worst case. There is situations where you cannot overcome it. So, but nobody forces us to just merge the data, right? So is there better ways of taking this data from multiple sources and learning on it? And this is the topic of multi-source learning. Um, so I'm first gonna talk about work from my former student, Nicola, who's now at, at ETH, um, and students, um, Elias, from the group of Dan Alistair, also at our institute. So here's the setting. We have given a bunch of data sets, S1 to Sn. Each of them is sampled from the true distribution, but um, oh, the original setting is they would be given from the true distribution. We have a set of possible models that we want to train, and we have an algorithm that now takes a bunch of data sets, um, so n times n samples, and it outputs a trained model. That would be the abstract way of learning from multiple sources. And then you can do this by joining the data, or you can do that by, I don't know, throwing away some data, or you can do this any other way you want. <clears throat> now, the, the unreliable situation that I'm talking about is the same, except you're not given this clean data. But there is an original set of clean data, but you have an adversary, which is a mathematical concept that takes this input of all the data, and it outputs new data out of which a fraction of the sources might have changed. Um, and again, we're adopting this adversary setting from the computer science world in, um, because if you allow it to do worst case manipulations, this covers all other manipulations as well. 
So the adversary might choose to randomly flip labels. That way you model labor noise. Or the adversary might uh, decide to drop half of the data. That would simulate the setting of missing data. Or it might try to explicitly poison the classifier with a backdoor that is covered in adversary and so on. So by studying the adversary situation, if we can solve it, we've solved all other cases as well, um, which is something I like. So the adversary, um, as, a, as a thought concept, outputs new data sets, and the only condition is that a certain fraction of them have to be the same as before, and the rest can be arbitrary. Um, and there's a fraction that can be changed, and this fraction is, is, is alpha. Um, the adversary can know everything. It can know our training algorithm. It can know the true data distribution. It can be randomized. It can be non-randomized. We don't care about its computational power. Right? We want to be safe against anything, or at least we should try. Now, the adversary outputs these sets, and then the learning algorithm gets these sets in order to produce a model. And of course, the model, I mean, the learner doesn't know which ones are manipulated and which ones are not. That would be cheating. <clears throat> now, is there a way of learning an optimal model, meaning that if we get more and more data in each data source, um, we get back to the original clean accuracy as if no adversary had been there? We already saw that if we just throw the data together, there isn't an algorithm like this. But what if we don't throw the data together? What if we do something smarter? And the answer is luckily yes. So there is an algorithm that has the following property. If we run it on this manipulated data, so the learner applied to the manipulated data sources, or potentially manipulated data set, and then we check its error on future data. So this will not be bigger than the error of the best possible model, so this would be optimality. No model is better than that. Plus a term that is big O tilde blah blah of two terms, both of which decrease if the sample size goes to infinity. So the first one decreases like one over n times n, and the other goes like one over square root of n, or one over square root of capital N times n, and the other is alpha times one over square root of n. We discussed that um, in a bit, um, where alpha is the fraction of sources that can be changed. It can't be bigger than one half because otherwise there would be no way of telling which. I mean, if you can exactly manipulate half of the data and half is not, you can always create completely impossible situation, right? So you just flip all labels and then there's no way of telling what was the correct labels. So this is the result we want to achieve. So we can prove that such an algorithm exists. It's a start, but it's not super helpful, because what is it? Um, well, um, first we have to understand why would this result exist? Why would it be possible to learn optimally in this setting where it wasn't possible in the previous setting? So why is learning from multiple sources simpler than learning from a single big source? And the answer is it's not actually easier. Um, but the adversary is more limited. In the original setting, you had one big data chunk of data, and you can do any manipulation you want. In the second, you have a partitioning into groups, and you can only change a whole group at a time. And this means you cannot arbitrarily, for example, in the example I had last time, if you have a data set of which a certain fraction is class one and the rest is class two, if the adversary deletes everything of class one, it would be impossible to learn what class one is. But if you have this partitioning, then each partition has a chance of seeing class one, and you cannot delete all of them, even if it's a small number overall. So the, it's, it's harder for an adversary to manipulate a, a fixed fraction if it only has access to them in batches. And this is kind of realistic, because if, you, if you're a user on the web, you cannot influence what other people type, right? Or if you're a hospital and your Excel is broken, uh, that doesn't influence other people's hospitals, right? So it's, you do influence a fraction of the data, but it's not an arbitrary fraction. <coughs> so the algorithmic idea is to exploit the fact that these batches are either clean or dirty, and if we make them bigger and bigger, we can exploit the law of large numbers, and we know that the majority of data sets will not be affected. So if the number of data points goes up, these will look more and more similar to each other because they're all sampled from the same distribution. So we can use some kind of test to identify which of the sources start to look more and more similar and cluster together, and which ones might not. <coughs> so the algorithm in the end is the following. So we want to first identify which sources to trust. So that means we, uh, we need a, a compare distance measure between all the different data sets, dij. Um, and if the dij is less than a threshold, we think, yes, these are similar. And otherwise, we say they're not similar. And we, for each data set, i, we check how many others is it similar to. And if it's at least half of them, then we think, well, this looks like a trustworthy data set, and we keep it in our set. And if it's not more than half of them, 
we throw it out. Afterwards, we have a set of trustworthy data sets. We merge those, and we minimize the training error. And then if the distance measure and the threshold have the right properties, we can prove that this will achieve optimality. So the crucial component here is how do we compare these data sets? Because um, there's many ways of computing two different sets of samples to each other. Um, so we have to understand what properties they have. Ah, sorry. Let me first visualize this because I made all these nice pictures of slides. Sorry. Um, so here's the first data set. This is a very schematic um, visualization. Each of these gray thingies is a data set. And as you can see, they're all very similar to each other because they're nearby to each other. So now for every of them, we compute the distance to all the others. We check how many are below a threshold. Let's say it's these. So it's similar to five others. Five is more than half. So this is a trustworthy data set. Here's an, another data set. It's similar to those. This is also a trustworthy data set and so on. And then after we went through all of them, all of them happen to be trustworthy. We haven't lost any data. Life is good. Now, what if some of them are manipulated? Um, let's assume that some of the data sets have been manipulated so they now look almost like coronaviruses. Um, if we now look and we compare the similarity, the ones in the center will still be similar to more than half because there's more than half in this cluster. But the ones on the outside, they are not similar within a certain radius to more than half, right? So these will not enter the trustworthy set. We throw them out. Of course, the adversary doesn't have to make them look all over the place, right? So the adversary could make them cluster together as well in order to fool us. But then this cluster will be at most less than half of all sources. So no point in this cluster will be similar to more than half of the others, not if it's located here. So none of these will enter the trusted set. What can happen is that while well, the adversary isn't stupid, it wants to be close to, I mean, it wants to have a cluster of more than half, so it can just make them look very similar to the ones that we already have. Right? So in this case, each class is similar, even the manipulated ones are similar to the others, and ultimately all of them will enter the trusted set. So this is a case we have to consider. The adversary isn't stupid, right? It knows that we will apply this threshold operation so it can move the data sets around to be as close as it wants to the ones that are clean. Still, they are not clean, they are manipulated. So that has to be reflected in the distance. So the properties of the distance need to be at least the following. So if we sample two data sets from the same distribution, then at least in the limit of more and more data, the distance has to get smaller and smaller, meaning they have to cluster together. <clears throat> that means all the clean data sets will start to merge eventually to each other and become a big cluster that we can identify. That's easy to achieve. At the same time, if the distance is small, then the learning should not be affected because we know that adversaries can be similar to clean data sets. So the, data, the distance must ensure that small distance means learning is not affected. And then even if the data set contains manipulated sources, as long as they're very similar to the manipulated ones, it doesn't hurt us because learning is not affected. So this is a second property. They must cluster together, and if they are together, they don't hurt learning. And this makes it much harder because most distances that you will come up with, probably all of them, um, will not have that property at the same time. So people compare, how do you compare two sets of vectors, two sets of samples? You can do average things like average commutative distance or Hausdorff distance or any of these, but these will either not have property one or they will not have property two. There's probabilistic distances such as Wasserstein or total variation, kohlberg lab divergence, which are based on statistical um, probability distributions, which then um, will ensure the second property. So if two things are similar in kohlberg lab divergence, then they will have the property that learning on them doesn't make a big difference. But then you cannot compute these on finite data or uh, I mean, if you just have two sample sets and you don't make additional assumptions, then just more samples will not make the Kohlberg lab smaller, um, unless you have additional assumptions about smoothness, which you can't make by a priori. Um, so the distance that does fulfill this luckily exists, and it's the, the discrepancy distance that we already saw in a different variant before. So the discrepancy distance here in the supervised form is you have a set of possible classifiers H, then you define the discrepancy distance between two data sets as the maximum that any classifier can achieve in terms of difference of classification accuracy. So this is the accuracy on class on data set one. This is the accuracy on data set two. What classifier makes them most different from each other? Um, and for binary classification, you can also visualize this as trying to learn a classifier 
that distinguishes between the two data sets. But since now you have labels, it has to be between the two classes in the data set, and the actual um, mechanism would be you take your two data sets, in one of them you flip the labels, then you merge them and try to learn a classifier. And this turns out to be numerically equivalent to this discrepancy distance. So the distance is one minus twice the error rate of that. So let's look at an example. These are two data sets, hopefully dissimilar ones. So um, the blue and the orange, each of them has positive and negatives. You flip the labels of one of them, so negative uh, orange turns into positive orange. Then you throw them together into a single data set, and then you try to learn a classifier that separates pluses from minuses. That's not hard, right? Positives on top, negatives at the bottom. That means that you find a classifier with small error. One minus twice the error will be the discrepancy. Discrepancy will be large. Here's two data sets that are quite similar to each other. So if you do the same process and you flip um, the signs of one of them and then you throw them together, now pluses and minuses are quite all over the place. And if you try to learn any classifier, it will not have a small training error. Um, so no classifier exists that has a small training error here of the linear type. So the discrepancy must be small. And this means these two, um, if you learn on one or if you learn on other, will not have a big uh, difference in the functions you learn. And you can formalize this. So if you have a training set um, S that you would like to train on, but instead you get an arbitrary set S prime, which could be manipulated, but its discrepancy to the training set is small. And then you train on it and you check how well does this work on new clean data then you can, uh, you can prove easily that the error on new data will not be bigger than the error you achieve on the training set plus two terms that can be controlled. One is the discrepancy that we assume to be small, and then is the discrepancy between train and test, which we know will go to zero if we have enough data. So that means if we now minimize the error on our training sets, which is what learning is all about, right? we minimize this quantity, that automatically means this quantity will also be small, and in the limit where these go to zero, we are optimal in terms of that. So discrepancy has this property that um, small discrepancy implies we learn similar, uh, the losses on, are similar, meaning learning has a similar effect. <coughs> okay, and this gives us the theorem. So if we do these steps, then we have um, the, 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 the loss of learning with this procedure in the future will be the optimal one plus two terms, one which scales like the number of clean sources times the number of samples per source, and one which is the fraction of non-clean times the square root of the number of sources. Both go to zero if your um, sample size goes to infinity. And this is actually, as, as often in these theoretical results, you can give some intuition to these. And the first is that, so k times m, this is the number of clean sources in the data. Some of them are manipulated, but k times m remain that we know are clean. And one over square root of that is just the rate you would get from learning from only the clean sources. If, if you have an oracle that tells you these are the clean sources, the others can be bad, you throw away the bad ones, you keep only the clean ones, this is the rate that you would get. In real life, you get a slowdown by this alpha times one over square root of m factor, which is due to the manipulations because you don't know which ones. So basically, this is the cost of identifying which ones are the bad ones. Um, and you can also prove lower bounds that show that this is unavoidable. So you cannot, no algorithm can be substantially better than this alpha times one over square root of m. Okay, so I have a few minutes left, probably four. Um, so this was all about accuracy, right? So um, I also promised fairness, and we did a follow-up work on this that was just accepted a few days ago, or by a week ago by now, at the Transaction of Machine Learning Research, DMLR, uh, with our student Jen, also from Dan Alistair's group, and my former student Nico. Um, so this is about, can we do similar things when we not just care about accuracy, but also we care about any of these fairness notions? Um, so can we assume that the classifier doesn't discriminate if there is an adversary who makes the, tries to make the classifier unfair? And this covers, again, the adversary doesn't need to be an evil person, right? It could be just a person who's prejudiced or a person who just checks on the street that certain example. So you could have an adversary that takes your data and then just lets some people go and other people it keeps in the data set or something like that. So this means we are in the same setting as before, but in addition, we have this protected attribute that could be any of the properties we want to ensure. And we want to find a function that has low, low error, obviously, but it should also fulfill some notion of group fairness at the same time. Um, these are the two we have already seen, demographic parity, also called independence and equality of opportunity. 
Um, and we're mainly going to talk about the demographic parity, the, the independence criterion. Um, as before, we're in the setting where we have multiple data sources, and some of them can be manip manipulated. So we're getting multiple data sources, and we get the output of an adversary, which could be anything, except it has to keep an alpha fraction. Uh, no, we can manipulate an alpha fraction. One minus alpha, it has to leave as it is. Now, is it possible to overcome this not just with respect to accuracy, but also with respect to fairness? And that's not a trivial question because fairness is not a property that is defined on the per sample level. Right? So fairness is a quantity that's defined across, on average, across all samples. So it's not just the same as, as trying to I mean, control accuracy. Nevertheless, the result, so, um, sorry, this is, sorry, I should have mentioned, this is the single source setting, right? I, sh I mean, you should have interrupted me. Um, this is one source of data points and a fraction is manipulated. Can we overcome this? No. As in the case of accuracy itself, you can an adversary can manipulate the fairness of the system um, and it can even do that without affecting the accuracy in some situations. So it's not so easy to spot that the fairness has been violated if, um, because the accuracy might look as good as it does before. But in the multi-source setting that I'm going to talk about, now we have multiple data sets here, and a certain fraction of the sources can be manipulated. Now, again, you can rescue the system. And you can find an algorithm that preserves both the accuracy and the fairness, whatever fairness criterion we had here. So this is demographic parity where we proved it. So this is, in a sense, good news. It just extends the previous result to other quantities beyond accuracy. Um, so multi-source learning is still a promising way of addressing these issues. <clears throat> the algorithm is, yes. Mm -hmm. Is there alpha in this theorem somewhere? Um, yes. And where? I mean, oh, I, in, yeah, in but in the theorem. In the theorem, yes. So th it's basically the same uh, alpha times square root of m dependence, yes. Yes, so I mean, we don't print the alpha, but yes, the alpha is still there. So I mean, this one is the same result as before, right? So the accuracy is bounded by some term that is one over square root of m, where, and there's an alpha in there, yes. Okay. I mean, the alpha is less than one, right? So by not printing it, we're just I mean, making it like look weaker than it is. Yes, so the algorithm is also pretty similar to before, except we use a slightly more practical version. In the previous version, we needed a fixed threshold, and this threshold had to be derived somehow from the properties of the data, and in order to do it in practice, uh, you had to be very conservative, and you would have needed a lot of data. So now we do a slightly more robust version where we use quantiles. So we, every data set uh, is considered to be similar to an, um, a, a certain quantile of others, and as long as the quantile is less than one half, um, we know that it has to be, um, or we take one half essentially, then that means all the bad ones should be outside of this quantile and all the good ones should be in as long as the distance has the good properties. So I'm not going to go into detail, I'm just going to show you a very colorful plot, which is um, pretty, and what you see here is the result of accuracy and of fairness for ordinary training without protection versus different methods of protection, and you see that for different columns here, which is different ways how the data could have been influenced, accuracy or fairness go down, whereas if you use this flea method that we propose, it doesn't go down, which means we are as good as if we had known in advance which of the sources are done. So this is my conclusion. Learning from multiple sources is a good idea of, of, of how to deal because it does reflect the real world. At the same time, it's a more powerful setting than just thinking about big data sets. Um, you can expand this in all kinds of directions, federated learning, privacy preserving, efficiency, and so on. Um, and you can do this uh, in a formal setting, how to deal with data manipulations, um, like an adversary or label noise and so on. Uh, so, I mean, we can, we can prove theorems about this, not just try it experimentally. And I think that's it. Thank you. We have negative minute one for questions, which is plenty. Don't worry, there is coffee waiting. <laughs> That's mean. Nobody is <laughs> going to drink away the coffee. Co three minutes until coffee. <clears throat> okay, so uh, thinking about this kind of 
connecting this, this fairness principle. So let's say uh, we think of an adversary that's an active adversary, but let's think back to this example of the chatbot, for example, that became racist. It, it, it might not be that there was a kind of active adversary that uh, poisoned the data, tried to make it racist, but just pe people inherently are racist. They, they talk they talk in, in a way that uh, has this bias and uh, the algorithm learned the bias. So how would you deal with that? Because the, in that way, the whole kind of data set would be, in a sense, uh, poisoned or adversarial in a sense? I mean, I think that the uh, chatbot example, is they were very actively racist, trying to like push it into being more and more racist because that's fun, right? To, 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 but um, of course, the, there is situations where the data has a certain bias or any kind of other than undesirable quantity by itself, not necessarily because of an adversary. We choose the adversary setting because all of that is included, right? So it's possible that a typical example is label noise or bias. So you are just, like, you have all the others except people with a, G, a GRA of five and you take 5.8, right? So you're just more stricter than others. But um, the adversary could do that, right? The adversary could say, I now accept, I now simulate whatever your procedure was. If your procedure was like a random distribution that isn't the same one, the, the adversary can, I mean, can, can also do that. Right? So the fact that it's not restricted it means it can do anything that a probabilistic assumption could, but it can also do others. So as long as you can then prove something, it's a good assumption to use the adversary. Of course, it's a much stronger assumption, and there is a big difference between randomly generating bad data and adversary creating bad data, just as there's a difference between randomly adding noise for adversarial examples, which doesn't work, and adversarially creating data, uh, random noise, which does create adversarial examples. Um, so if you... If you cannot prove anything against an adversary, then probably your assumption of an adversary is too strong and you have to go to something like, well, what is the data distribution is slightly different, like biased. But if you can prove it, this covers all the other cases as well. Thank you. Uh, I think, Christoph, uh, this I'll be here in the afternoon, you know that, right? <laughs> yes, this concludes your, uh, these major academic lectures today. Uh, later in the afternoon, the lecture is uh, public, so there will be, hopefully, uh, crowds from outside of our summer school as well. But this is uh, on the academic thank side. Um, thank you.